is Ryan Russell. Um, until recently he worked for me, until he decided he couldn't operate under my Nazi-like evil rule. So he bailed and went off to Big Fix, which is his new digs. He's exactly opposite Eric Schultz, which I don't know is good or bad, and that's a whole other mental picture that I'm going to have a hard time getting out of my head now. Hey, Eric is your ex. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go there. Kind of... We are here today to talk about our new version of TS Grinder, which is our terminal server brute force tool. That's when you hit next. Very good. The basic premise here is that we want to be able to provide a tool to everybody that you guys can use to assist you in your penetration tests. and really anything else that you might want to be doing, just to test out your own internal system security, of course. When Microsoft originally introduced terminal server functionality, it was in a separate product in Windows NT. You had to install the Windows NT terminal server edition. And it was really, it was really a very good, not only remote administration tool, but it provided remote application access for multiple users. When Windows 2000 was developed and released, Microsoft included as part of the install, part of the base default, well, not, it's not installed by default, but part of the Windows 2000 product, they included terminal services. There are basically two modes to Windows 2000 terminal services. Remote administration mode, which supports two concurrent admin logins as well as the local desktop login, and what they call application mode. Application mode is based on licenses and will allow as many concurrent connections as your licensing and or hardware can support. Terminal services became very widely deployed within infrastructures because it was really a wonderful way to remotely manage assets, particularly if they're far away and you don't want to have to do everything through remote procedure calls and things of that nature and shares and, and what have you. You could terminal server into the box and, and manage that guy. So we immediately saw the need for you guys to have a tool that would allow you to brute force these connections and see if you can get in. The original method of a little history here. When I first wanted to write TS Grinder, um, I went at it via the terminal server ActiveX control. So I thought what we'd be able to do was use that ActiveX control and hook into that guy and basically set up as many concurrent logons as we could to a server, supply a username and password, and see if we could break in. One of the neat things about terminal services is that the logon is an actual local logon to the machine. It's not a network-based logon to the system. And what that means to us is that the administrator account cannot be locked out because you can't lock out the admin account for local logon, right? So if we know that somebody has not renamed the administrator account, and we can hit that box with terminal services, we can basically hammer away at it all day long and not have to worry about that account being locked out. So we wanted to leverage that. And that was the original ActiveX control. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. The ActiveX control, by default, would not allow you to script the username and password. You could script the username, but you couldn't programmatically inject the password. So through some tinkering around, we figured out with the help of like a lot of people that via the vtable binding of the ActiveX control, if you went at it at that method, you could actually expose the TS non-scriptable interface. And it was like, woohoo, great. Now I've got this hidden interface that I can expose the scripting elements. So I can provide username and password. And it worked. But it didn't work on a default install of terminal services. 
So after a while, we pulled the tool because it was kind of ghetto, right? I mean, if it's not going to work on a default install, the value of the tool is really greatly diminished. So we pulled that away, and we've been trying to figure out ways of making a really robust terminal server brute force tool. Well, one day, Mark Burnett, I saw him in here somewhere. There he is with his head down. Mark Burnett emails me and says, hey, the simulated terminal server client tool that you basically use to um, stress test your installations, that guy allows you from a script to, is this too loud, by the way? I'm like speaking and people are going like this. Okay. Maybe it's just from last night. So the terminal server client, the, the SM client or robo client stress test tool actually allowed us to do some of this. So after Mark turned us on to that, we started to explore some new things. Let's go ahead and um, other things that we were looking at doing was to reverse engineer the actual RDP protocol from scratch. Well, I wasn't looking at doing that. I don't know how to do that. Ryan knows how to do that. Mark probably knows how to do that in Litchfield and Halvar and those kind of guys. So that approach wasn't very feasible. I mean, that would have taken a lot of work. We could use our desktop from ourdesktop.org. And those are the guys who have done a lot of work on actually and they have, reverse indeed, engineering the protocol. For the RDP protocol. And in fact, I believe that's the ba there was one, one brute force tool made its way public in between Terminal Server Grinder and TS Grinder 2, and that's TS Crack, right? And that's a glyph based system. We'll talk about that in like just a second. The other thing we could do is this SM client from the Windows 2000 Server Resource Kit. You can actually download it directly off of the Microsoft FTP site without signing any agreements that you won't reverse engineer it, which is a bonus. I guess it's still, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know about the legalities of that. And the last thing we were thinking about is hooked directly into the Microsoft Terminal Server client itself. Next, please. So reverse engineering the protocol, there was enough work done on that I didn't know how to do it, so that really wasn't very feasible. If I don't know how to do it, it's out of here. Um, next. Now, the rdesktop.org was very interesting. It's a fairly functional, I mean, the, the interface that those guys created and the research that they did provides us with some really neat stuff like the RDP client for Linux, right, that you get from those guys. It is the closest public documentation that we found to RDP. One of the problems, though, is that it's a glyph-based system. It deals with graphics. It doesn't deal with text. And what we wanted to be able to do was monitor the text stream from the client session to the server session so that we could really find out what's going on. So rather than trying to look at a graphic and determine what the status of the system was in, we wanted something much more robust. So. At Burnett's recommendation, we really got into this SM client. And it looks like what we want to do. Basically, they provide a couple of interfaces for us, and they allow us to script the username and password. Again, the purpose of this is for you to be able to connect to and launch applications in an application mode terminal server session so that you can do stress testing. So you can go to the box and do performance monitoring and say, OK, I'm going to have 35 remote users running Microsoft Word or running Office or whatever they're going to be running. So you'd want to see what the server, how the server reacted to that for, for, for performance reasons and things of that nature. One of the weird things about it is it does allow multiple simultaneous clients. Right, But when you use the tool, you find out that it always tries the same password. There was really no way of effectively hooking into that DLL and saying to it, 
try this password with the admin account, oh, but now try this one. If you gave it the wrong password in this tool, it would try it six times, at which point the client, the server session would shut down. And I thought that was like really stupid, and I didn't know why they did it like that. But that was our entry point, the fact that this guy would allow us to script it. So if we wanted to, the, the last thing we thought about was hooking directly into the client. And as it turns out, that's exactly what the robo client, SM client DLL does. During our exploration of the support of that DLL, we were shocked and amazed to find out that Microsoft had an undocumented API in that guy. Yes, I know. So, for a couple of reasons, I'm going to have Ryan, one, I don't, like I said, I don't know how to reverse engineer stuff. Oh, I didn't say that. I'm going to have Ryan tell you guys you about what this so. hidden interface is so as he gets sued because now he works for another company. Uh, one of the things that Tim was talking about is the, uh, what's called RoboClient. You can find it for free on the Microsoft FTP site, which is quite fortunate. Uh, you can download it. There's no click-through licenses. Grab a copy. There's nothing in the file. It's actually just the executable that you would get off the CD if you bought the Windows 2000 server resource kit. This is the server kit, the one that's this wide, not the workstation kit that's this wide. Um, and if you buy the printed version of it, you actually have to rip the little license agreement open that says, I won't do things like reverse engineer the, the software. So if you actually take a look at how SM Client works, um, it's fairly small. And you compare it to the whole rest of all the terminal services stuff, you wonder how they could fit all that functionality in there. Comes with a few different pieces. One is smclient.exe, which is the program you would actually normally run and feed it a script to, you know, go and load balance or load test your terminal server to actually beat on it, run the program, that kind of thing. And as Tim mentioned, if you give it a good name and password, it logs in the first time, does the rest of the script, and you know, reports back to how long it took and all that. It actually allows you to launch applications and yeah. do whatever you want. If you're and just to hop in for a second. If you monitor that conversation between the server and the client using this tool, you'll see that it's all in text. And you'll see that the S channel connect, the S channel send, the S channel receive functions are passing text elements back and forth. And that was really what we wanted. Um, just, you know, kind of to reiterate a point that Tim made a couple slides ago about the rdesktop.org client, which is actually is, is real, real nice. I was very impressed. Under active development, they're working on getting sound and file transfers and other things like that that are new with XP working. So if you actually have any need for a, a Unix um, a terminal server client, that, it works very well. The one problem I ran into, is, as Tim mentioned, is, is they use glyphs. So if you're trying to essentially read what you get back on the screen, you don't get back ASCII code, you don't get back Unicode. You're getting back a bitmap of each letter as you go. Um, and I think one insane guy actually was doing OCR back on some of the glyphs he was getting back to, and that may have been the guy that worked on the... I think that's what it was. And some people have seen it and they like the tool. Okay. Um, what, what's interesting though is like once you get the remote desktop in this, in this client, you can, let's say that you have Outlook, an Outlook icon on the screen. It tells you that. It gives you the full textual version of the desktop. So there's really some interesting analysis things that we can do with that. We'll tell you about that as what, uh, what's part of uh, 2.0 or 1. Dot whatever. Yeah. You're, you're and the, uh, basically what happened is the artist.org guys, basically you know, the screen paints correctly, so they were happy. They let it go at that. Um, in my case, I actually needed the actual text and letters. Uh, their theory is, again, they're working with an undocumented protocol, is that if the client hands the server a list of fonts that it's got installed, then you get back uh, actual Unicode. If you, if you tell it, I have no fonts installed, you wouldn't normally know how to paint a sans serif 8 italic, whatever, so it actually hands you bitmaps. That's what the difference is there. So they may, one of these days, get around and actually fix that. So uh, I asked a question on the mailing list. You can go search and catch the thread if you're, if you're really curious. Anyway, back to the way Microsoft's doing it. Um, SM client, and there's also this tclient.dll, which you have to have, otherwise the thing just kind of bails. And if you look carefully, um, watch when the programs are being run, 
SM client actually executes mstsc.exe, which is Microsoft's terminal server client, with a couple of undocumented command line switches, which we've got up here on the slide. CLX, DLL, and uh, the CLX command line. So by default, the way the Microsoft's tool works is uh, when it runs mstsc.exe, it passes it the clxtshare.dll, which is also out of the RoboClient kit, and this command line, um, which has hsmc equals something, smclient underscore, underscore, and a proc ID and a thread ID. What it's actually doing is it's actually creating a window, which is the hwnd uh, there, um, for, it, for it to actually script. This is part of how it hooks into the uh, Microsoft Terminal Server client, and it uh, passes this SM client string, which actually you'll find when the tool is running, you'll find it in your registry. And that'll, the, the first proc ID there is process ID and the thread ID, uh, as you can see there on the end. So that's where some of the settings live, things like the screen resolution, um, as well as a bunch of other settings. So this is how the, how the tool works kind of behind the scenes. Turns out, more or less, that uh, starting with Windows 2000, in order to enable this functionality for the tool that Microsoft put out, they appear to have given themselves this undoc undocumented command line switch. You search on Google or on uh, MSDN, you're not going to find any reference to any of these command line switches. Um, and the way it works is you actually put in a callback uh, DLL, which in this case is clxtshare.dll, and you put in a bunch of functions, and you actually now are able to hook into the Microsoft Terminal Server client. Um, did, I, did I geek out enough on that, Tim, or you want to, something else we want to cover? Oh, yeah, there's like I mean, if folks are interested in repeating some of my work, uh, drop me a note. My email address is at the, it's on the last slide or something like that. I'd be happy to uh, help document this a little further if you're interested. Okay, next. So this little SM client, like you said, is a simple front end to the T client to the T client DLL. And it looks like that guy does what we want it to do. However, so the documentation of this thing is very poor. There is one, there's basically one document that accompanied the RoboClient kit that gave some reference to the functions that you could expose inside of T client. This SC connect function, function itself is hard coded to do six attempts with the same password. So we thought about hooking into that guy and trying to somehow bypass that. And it's the, like I said, it's the, it's, it's the same password each time. When I was originally, when I was trying to write some code to expose this stuff, since none of it is documented, I had to load the library, get these functions, and basically try to figure out what variable class types the function was expecting, what types it was expecting to pass through. And we finally found where the SC Connect does accept a parameter for username and password and all of this stuff. So it was like, great, we're on the same, we're on the right track. However, by the time you arrive at that conclusion, you realize it doesn't work. Whoever wrote that built the framework around it, but never made it do anything. So it was clear to us that we had to write our own sconnect function. It also became clear to us why it was this six time you're out deal. From a logging standpoint, you can log on, okay, so you build up your RDP session, you can attempt to log on five times without creating a log entry. If you attempt to log on the sixth time, that's whenever an event log will be triggered. So obviously, that's why they hard-coded six times in there, so that somebody could not use that tool for what we wanted to use it for. I mean, you actually could use it for that. It would just be incredibly slow, and it would dance all over the logs. And it, that was exactly, cool. exactly. Um, and there's a don't forget about the um, maximum number of window log thing. We need to mention that. So if, like we said, if you do only five, and then disconnect, there's no log. So what do you think we do? We try to connect up five times now and then disconnect and then build the session back up again and f try another five times. It would really be nice if we could build one session and just, if, if, if we didn't really care about creating log entries, if we could build up the session and keep hammering it, unfortunately the server itself 
knows. It will disconnect it after six tries, even if you don't want it to. Even if you don't care about um, creating log files. So given this, for performance, we wanted to have multiple thread capability so that what we could do is open up as many simultaneous connection windows as the server could support, try our five different passwords each time, all pulling from the same dictionary file and keeping a log of where it was. So each thread keeps a log of where it is in the dictionary file, obviously, so that you can have all multiple, as many windows as you want open. If you're lucky enough to find or you know that there is a server out there in application mode, that's whenever this could, you could really leverage that. So you could set 10 simultaneous threads to open all at the same time so that you're basically getting 50 attempts at a time. That would make it a much, much faster tool. What we found, though, is two is pretty much the sweet spot. You can do two or three in a regular server session. Windows XP actually allows you to have two. Um, and most of the things that we've been doing, two seems to work the best. Because if the server is just in remote, app, remote administration mode, if you try to open the third window, it generates a log. It'll generate a log entry saying, wait a minute, I can't support this many simultaneous client connections. Though we don't have the functionality now, what we're looking at doing is trying to find a way of, hook, of, of identifying that so as we can shut down the window. So if you say load 10, it supports 2, it kills off 8 and then keeps the 2 going so as you don't fill up the event log with all of these events and then bring some attention to yourself. Even then, that's something, if you're trying to be stealthy, if you're doing a pen test and you try not to show up or something like that, you really want to know that ahead of time because by the time it figures out that those other 8 aren't going to connect, or the third one, or whichever one it is, it's still going to have created a log entry. OK, so our ultimate solution was to write our own connect function, but use the rest of the functions that TS Client already supports, because all that work's already done. No need to reinvent the wheel. Because we have exactly the amount of control that we need in our own sconnect function. Like we said, the documentation, it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. It's compiled in debug mode. Consequently, we had to compile our code in debug mode because it will crash in release mode, in T client, because it's in debug mode. So if you look at our code and say, wow, they shipped it in debug mode, that's why. And let's go. Okay. Let's do future next. Let's get to the demo. Nobody cares anymore. They want to okay. see it work. You only going to make them sit through you talking for like 20 something minutes? No, no, no. They the don't demo? care. Okay. They just want to see the tool, right? Everybody just wants to see the tool. Right, okay. Okay, so I've got an XP box over here. Kind of the way XP works, since you really you don't have true remote, it's remote desktop and XP. If this guy's logged on and you remote desktop into him and try to log on as a different username or as a different user account than is currently logged on, you will get a message saying, hey, somebody's already logged on. Do you want to disconnect them? So what I've done is I've got this guy logged off. That way we won't, um, we won't screw anything up. It's just our own little private network. Let's look at some of the, the, the flags real quick. Real quick, let me just... Um Show him what, I mean, there's, I don't know if there's anybody out there who hasn't even actually used remote desktop on, on XP. It's really great. I mean, I use it for not having to walk down the hall in my house. I got the laptop in my bedroom. If I don't feel like going, you know, 30 feet down the hall to the desktop, I can just, you know. But don't use my tool against my box, please. So, I mean, this is about it. You get the login prompt and, uh, and all that. And when you log in successfully, you get your whole desktop. Um, no. Yes, you can. Which? Uh, right. You <laughs> Click. I'll do all the simple stuff for you, Ryan. <laughs> Click up on the little. Oh, uh, just, uh, the DOS window. Sorry, just, yes. Just. You are a girly man. 
looks good from here. Right? Here, let's make some big, big old fonts. Oh, it's just getting silly. Okay. At least you just didn't tell the guy to come closer. And let's do um, the screen. I'm screwing with my colors now. Would you just be quiet, please? Um, what do we want? Why do they do it like that? Let's make it blue. Because that's white. I assume 255 is the value. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to make it yellow. Maybe that'll be a little easier. You want is white easier, or you think a yellow text would be easier? Yellow. It's just the simple stuff. That... Yeah, blue, blue. There's a yellow down there. If you oh, can see. I just click on it? I think so. It's like I said. Okay, you know, if you did what I did last night, you'd be doing the same thing. So leave me alone. Okay. And we didn't make it any didn't bigger. didn't make the font any bigger, which is what the guy actually asked for. Would you be quiet, please? Jeez, everybody's just there. Yeah, thanks. No, it's actually All right, look, you do it. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. I don't think I'm actually going to fit all the way on the screen that way, so... That's fine. Just put it back where it was. Okay. Sorry. Download the tool. <laughs> That's not any better, is it? Okay. Do a black, black background. Oh, come on. Give me just download the tool. <laughs> All right. I'll, just, I'll, I'll read it for you. We have a couple of options here. Um, what we wanted was you obviously provide the dictionary file that you want to use. We wanted to be able to do leet translation of a normal dictionary file, meaning it'll take your, your E's and turn them to threes and all of that kind of stuff for people who've been like really their leet hacksaws with their passwords. So we wanted to be able to do that, and we want to supply the domain name, the username. Uh, one of the ways to defeat the earlier terminal server grinder was to have a logon banner. If you, if you told it to display a logon banner, they would pop up and say, give you some legal banner, you know, we'll shoot your parents if you hack into our machines, and you'd have to click OK. Well, at that point, there was no way to identify that and force a click through. So we have banner flag support, the number of simultaneous threads that we're going to run, and there's a debug level that we built in because Ryan wrote the code, and I needed that function. <coughs> so. Seattle. Would you, would you like a demo, Tim? Um, yeah, Can I yeah. Demo that for you. Let's demo that. So, uh, just as a simple one, I'm going to run through a short dictionary, two threads, which again is all you get on uh, remote desktop, the XP Pro version. So the command line is tsgrinder-n2, and if I can catch it quick enough, you see we actually have two windows going at the same time. Not one, two. Five, and five attempts. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. No, no, if you want to tell no, them. Oh, no. Yeah, fine. After five attempts, kills the window, no log entry gets created that way, and goes on and tries it again. And of course, on the background in the DOS box, it's telling you what password it tried, whether it failed and succeeded. Of course, it, when, it, when it gets to the success one, it just stops. This guy right here, you can actually see it if you have enough windows open. It's going through here and telling you that things failed. This one's not going to succeed. You know, what, what you, where did you get this list from? It's a list of stuff that's around my office. Well, what were you, you ask, go, raccoon, giraffe, dog, cat, balls? I mean, <laughs> what were you looking at? I got a jack in the. <laughs> got a jack in the box antenna ball sitting on my desk, if you must Seattle. know. Okay. Can I, can I pop your box now? Can I, can I own your own oh, yeah. machine? Oh, yeah, okay. if you Thank think you. it's going to work. And this one, we actually kick in the, the leet speak thing. Uh, the leet file is fairly simple format, standard translation stuff.
So you'll see it kind of going through the machinations here, changing the E to a 3 and the O to a 0, all that kind of stuff. Ta-da! Ladies and gentlemen, T.S. Grinder. So if you catch Tim's machine on the hotel network later on, pass over to T-H-0-R. Oh, great. I just changed that for this. It was this crazy 97 thing. Yeah, I forgot. That's why I changed it back. Okay, so now let's kind of talk about some of our future options. One thing we need to do that was really obvious to us that we didn't build in was changing the port. As it is now, the default listen port for terminal services is 3389. People who are deploying terminal services on the internet for clients to be able to connect up to, whether it's directly on the net, which is crazy, or published through ISA server or what have you, should change the terminal server listen port. And XP, all right, so if you do that, there, there's a good and a bad thing about that. One, your users have to know that. And as we all know, most of them are lucky if they can type in a host name. And the Windows 2000 client, if you're going to connect up to a server that's got a different port, you actually have to export the connection profile, change it, and then import it in again. It's kind of a pain in the behind to do that for all of your people. In XP, it's great. That little remote client allows you to go ahead and do MS TSC. Here, just bring up the thing. So you put in the host name and a colon and the port you want it to connect to. So after the host name here, under computer, in computer. Are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to what you. Do you. What do you, you want? I'm talking to them? I kind of thought. You would just put a colon and then the, uh, and the port number. And that's pretty easy for people. And then that way, you won't fall prey to random port scans or people looking for 3389. Well, I was more interested in the command line version because that's what I would actually have to do. And it looks like it's going to be fairly easy. Same thing, but a colon after the server name. Which is good for me because you didn't actually talk to me about this feature. You just promised them that I have to write. So. Well, which is uh, actually what I just said, if you okay. noticed that. So, the, um, so we're going to add different port functionality as well. Um, the leet... The leak conversion is a little flaky right now, so we're going to need to work on that. More importantly, what we're doing is we're going to put all this out on the Hammer of God site, and anything that you guys want this to do, really feel free to email Ryan, <laughs> and um, he'll get right on that. <laughs> to avoid stuff like this, make sure to, to avoid yourself being susceptible. Normally, renaming the administrator account doesn't really buy you anything. Everybody knows that it's the, stand, the, it's the 500 RID and it takes two seconds on the infrastructure to find out what the real administrator name is. On a published terminal server, you know, that's not necessarily the case. They're not going to be able to hit it with NetBIOS. So renaming the administrator account in that case is actually pretty smart because then they're not going to know by default that you have an administrator account. Also, make sure that you've set in your group policy elements that you have some level of account lockout. Otherwise, any account that we find, we'd be able to, to use this tool to brute force. So, that's really about it. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> Anyone from Microsoft here? The question was, why does it not log until after 6? I don't know. I don't know either. Actually, if we have any good you know, heavy-duty terminal server admins, we would actually like to publish with the tool you know, what's the registry setting where we can crank that down for people. That's absolutely. The other thing that, I wanna, that we want to build into this, something else that um, Mark Burnett discovered, is that this logging mechanism that takes place when Windows NT and Windows 2003, correct? Mark? 
You don't know what I'm talking about. Mark's like, I, I, I. whenever it logs these events, it pulls the computer name off the RDP stack. In Windows 2000, all it does is log your computer name, which does you absolutely no good. You know that some kid in Argentina named Schwing or whatever is the one who's trying to get into your box. In 2003, it actually logs the IP address. However, in both cases, that information is grabbed from the RDP stack, not the IP stack. So if we control the RDP protocol here, when this logging takes place, all we have to do is tell it what IP address we're coming from. Because it's going to ask RDP. It's not going to ask IP. So, yes, sir. It does, in 2000, it logs the IP. Re repeat the comment for everybody there, Tim. Um, he's saying that I was wrong, that Windows 2000 does, in fact, log the IP. I haven't seen that. He's saying it logs the IP once you successfully connect. Once you, oh, once you connect. Right, but then. But okay. Okay. So okay, he cool. Yes, sir. What kind of uh, in throughput rate are you getting? How many passwords per second do you get? Um, so far, we've gotten, it takes about a second and a half for each window on average to get five passwords. Five unique passwords. Five unique passwords. And, you know, of course, um, there'll be some latency. And it, so it depends on how fast the other machine is as well. So in our tests, it's pretty quick. You get, in a couple of seconds, you'll get 10. So depending on, oh, and Mark has a great, um, his dict is little. <laughs> and Mark has a very big one. <laughs> that he lets you get from his website. <laughs> now, Tim, I've I hear that anyway. Not that I would know. Now, Tim, I, I, on here, I've got a dick that's about a couple hundred times bigger than the one you've been working with. I mean, oh, really? If you want to <laughs> use that one instead. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Good night. <laughs> so, any other questions? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? Oh, yes, sir. Um, that was the one that I was talking about that, uh, I guess, oh, there you are. That he, there is a, a number of pre-compiled brute force dictionaries out there that you can use. It's just, it's really what your pick is. You know, whichever one that you want. The one that Mark has is, I don't know, four or five meg worth of actual passwords that he got sorted by, how sorted by how common they are. I, and I don't know if I want to know how you got those, but. And this tool does just go in order down the file, so Say. if you want to have some sort of, you know. Oh, what's your order. website location for that? Zato.net, and then you can download that. But you can use any, any standard uh, dictionary, dictionary tool that you want. At some point, we might build in like your standard brute force, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, sir. On that server, the logon process in, in, now I don't know 50 or 60, but as I was looking at processes of, of, of logon attempts, the, the, the logon process is actually is not that, um, it doesn't take that much time for the server. I have this great word in my head for what I'm trying to say. It's just stuck C CPU back there. Intensive? So um, with 50 or 60 of them, I don't know, it, it wouldn't, my thought is that it would not be evident to somebody else who may be in the machine working. The fact that it's trying to. Yes. 
50 or 60? And what was the hardware? Well, you know that matters. <laughs> so Mark's comment was that it was a 386. <laughs> Mark's um, comments was that 50 or 60 is reasonable. About 100 is where you start to lose it. And and, and are, are we maxing out on RAM or CPU? Uh, yeah. CPU. On 100 yes, megabit net. Absolutely. It's in the, uh, the dash U flag allows you to specify whatever user that you want to use. So if you've gotten, if you've gotten a list of users in other ways, like you've um, done some forced directory browsing and you see user credentials and connection strings or whatever you want, you can do, you can specify domain, you can specify user. Only, only multiple threads within the same memory space of one system. You can't have two different computers going at them at the same point. If you were going to do that, I would just say split your dictionary file in half. Yeah. Exactly. So, so in, in the multiple thread environment, it keeps track of where it is in the log file. So this, you know, these four threads are grabbing it. It knows where to pick up where the other one left off. Yes, sir. That was the same, um, oh, oh, you mean different PCs. Well, you could just run it in as many windows as you want it. So from an auditing environment, if I'm in a class C network and I want to take a look at 100 different ones. Sure. But I'm going to have to have that many. Just open up right. You'd have to have that many command prompts open that you're launching the tool in, and then you do multiple windows inside of that and up to the capabilities of your machine. Yes, sir. I'll get you next. That's a good, that's an excellent point. But I would rather have people not be able to log in because their accounts were locked out than somebody having remote GUI on your system. Right, well, and that's why you lock it out. And then you have a duration. So by the time they come in the next morning, it'll be you know, open again. Typically, it's a 30 minute, a 30 minute lockout period, three tries, 30 minutes, 30 minute um, reset time. Yes, sir. We don't know. Does anybody know if the standard MSTSC client works against Citrix? We don't have a Citrix box to, to test on. If anybody's got one, just mail me the IP address. I'll let you know. Yeah, if the, <laughs> if the normal Microsoft client works against it, then this would work against it. That's, that's one of the really... Go ahead. We need a Citrix client. Okay, Kevin's saying we need a Citrix client. That's one of the nice things about doing it this way is that anything that the Microsoft client supports, we, you know, by proxy support as well. There's even a chance that, you know, when new versions come out that we'll be backwards compatible. Currently, the text elements that we look for to um, indicate that we've received a logon banner, username, password, domain, options, whatever, that current set is hard-coded. One of the other options that I want to do is be able to specify with a file what text to look for in order for the, for the client to know that it's received a logon banner. And that's your multiple language support. If somebody has a different version of, of um, server, and this, so this works on XP 2000, Windows 2003, um, any of that kind of stuff. So that will allow us to, um, and I haven't loaded like the Japanese version. So I don't know if the Japanese, I think the Japanese version or the Chinese version or whatever has different characters for you know, username and password. So you can actually still use that against, use this tool against that kind of server. Yes, sir. Um, smart card Bruce Fording? I, no, I mean, if it requires a smart card, then I'd move on to a different server. I mean, unless you have their smart card. I, mean, I don't know how we would do that. Yes, sir. I'll get you next. 
We could. I mean, the way I wrote it, yeah, yeah. it's just a standard standard window type. I actually can feed the window type, so if you want to do SW minimized or something like that, uh, I can add, add an option for that for you. Yes, sir. As long as you can use the normal terminal server client against that host, yes. But I think if you change, like um, my admin changed the gene on his XP box, and I couldn't remote into his box anymore. Kind of pissed me off, actually. OK, thank you, thank you all very much. Thanks for coming in here. And enjoy the rest of your black hat. <laughs>